The great thing about science is that our faith is shakable. That I can work for 20 years on an idea that I think is beautiful and elegant and wonderful, but the minute nature tells me it's not true, out. I throw it out. That's the great thing about science. We have today a barbecue power special, because Lawrence Krauss was in Amsterdam for a lezing over his new book. And on the other manier hebben we het met the help of Ancilla for elkaar gekregen om een leuk gesprek met hem aan te knopen. Well, I hope what you said was good, but it was very positive. Totally. So you were now here in Amsterdam for uh, giving a lecture about uh, how something came from nothing and uh, being a theoretical physicist uh, you obviously try to explain it from a scientific perspective and not from a religious or uh, philosophical point of view. Yeah, absolutely, But I try and explain reality. The book I wrote was really to celebrate the remarkable revolutions in our understanding of the real universe and the fact that I find really worth celebrating that it is increasingly plausible that the universe can come from nothing without God. That, that without any supernatural shenanigans, just using laws of physics that we understand and observations we can make, that you could understand how the 100 billion galaxies we see in the universe could come from nothing. It seems counterintuitive and it's always been kind of the last bastion of, of some religious thought, that that's where you can hide God. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think you can hide God there anymore. Before Darwin, life was a miracle. And everything looked designed. And after Darwin, it was clear that by natural selection and random mutation in some sense that you could develop the diversity of life. It was plausible based on observations. Before what we see, have understood about physics, the universe seemed like it had to be a miracle, like you needed a God to create it. And now it's at least plausible that you don't, and that's worth celebrating. How can we explain it? What, what is it? How does well, it work? Well, I mean, well, we could talk a little bit. I wrote a whole book about it, so I guess, but one of the things we've discovered is that is that nothing is not what we thought it was. Namely, empty space, for example, is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that can pop in and out of existence. If you wait long enough, you're guaranteed that particles will appear. And stuff, matter, and enough matter potentially for all the galaxies in the universe. The thing that makes it most interesting is that when we look at our universe and we ask, what would the characteristics of a universe be that was created from nothing by these quantum mechanical processes? It would have the characteristics of the universe we observe. Does that prove that we came from nothing? No, but it makes it plausible. And if it's, as I say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. duck. Yeah. yeah. You're obviously one of the brightest I've ever had privileges to, to speak to. The thing is, I wonder when you have the toilet paper, do you um, uh, have it along the wall or f uh, away from the wall? I don't worry either way. Oh my god, okay. Yeah, yeah, I totally sorry. thought there was maybe some scientific explanation. You wrote um, a great book about uh, the science behind Star Trek. Yeah. What made you write about Star Trek? People are afraid of physics, but they're not afraid of Star Trek. So if I can use Star Trek to get people to think about physics, because most people are really fascinated by science, but they don't know it's science they're fascinated by. They've been taught in school to be afraid of science, or bo it's boring, boring and dull, or, right. but then you ask them about time travel or warp drives, then they get excited, and then they realize that that's science. We know there was a big bang, so you can, like, um, you can visualize uh, uh, like a big ball, uh, and that will be the end of the, the, the known or visible universe. Uh, that's how we see it as a mm -hmm. sort of a sphere, uh, but still scientists say um, it is infinite So how does that work because it's very difficult to explain to people? Well infinity is a very hard concept and our our visible universe in the, is a sphere in some sense simply because Light comes at us from all directions, but we see Out to an equal distance in all directions and that sphere is our observable universe right. But that sphere could be invented in an infinite universe or a non-infinite universe. We don't know if our universe is infinite. In fact, if it were really created from nothing, it's more likely that it's not infinite. It's just very, very large. It blew up at, at early scales by a process we think we understand called inflation that would have made our, our universe, what, what comprises our universe, vastly larger than we can see. The great thing about infinity is even if our universe is infinite, there could be an infinite number of infinite universes because infinity is a really weird quantity. <laughs> The limits of knowledge, in, in, in essence, or understanding the universe, which is which is hugely complicated. Um, may, are are we capable of answering that question? I mean, we can't explain quantum physics to a dog. 
how can our human brains, being physically limited with what we have, maybe even possibly understand the universe? Or do you think we are capable? There may be empirical limits for our knowledge. We can only see what we can see. Yeah. We can only measure what we can measure. That automatically puts limits. And we've been so successful in the last 20 years that we may be at the limits of asking empirical questions. It may be that we can't ultimately test some of our ideas. We can just say they're very likely. A multiverse, for ultimately, for example, we may have more and more indirect evidence, but we may, may never have be able to directly prove that a multiverse exists. It may just be likely. And in terms of our brains, you're right. Uh, there may be fundamental limitations of our understanding. Happily, as far as we can tell, mathematics is the language of nature, and our brains seem to be able to do mathematics very well. And so, whether there are whether there are theoretical limits to what we can understand or observation limits, we don't know. But we'll never know unless we try. That's the point. Is it true that if you watch a science fiction movie, you you, you just get annoyed? <laughs> Depends how good the movie is. I get annoyed if it's stupid. <laughs> I you know I don't mind things that aren't real as long as it I, it's easy for me to suspend disbelief, and it's easier if the story's good. So, you know, I don't say, oh my god, this is impossible. I don't look at, go to watch movies to see what's possible. Or not. I'm willing to ask, is the story plausible? And when the story's stupid, then I begin to realize how stupid the science is. I was disappointed in Prometheus. I, it was kind of too pseudo-religious to me. We want to discuss uh, all kinds of ways that the, the Earth or humanity could, could, could end. Could end. Actually, in five billion years, the sun is going to go, is going to eventually grow in size to encompass the Earth's orbit, which is not too, not too good for the Earth. But even before that, in two billion years, the Sun will have increased in luminosity by about 15 percent. The bottom line is, unless we do something dramatic, either leave the Earth or move the Earth. Is that even possible? Oh, it's easy to move the Earth, yeah, yeah. You just direct asteroids in near collisions with the Earth, and we, they exchange gravity and the Earth moves out slowly. But if we don't, the Earth is toast in two billion years, so hold on to your Apple stock for another two billion years and then sell it. And do you think that we're born in the, the exact right era, space and exploration? And I, don't, I don't know. I always think every, every era thinks it's the best time. And so I like to think the best is yet to come. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank Good. you very much.